Um, well, it's tempting for me to offer a lengthy pre preamble on something that I'm very passionate about personally. I think it's more important that I introduce uh, the panel members and that we get rolling and use our time really well. Um, with us today on the stage, we have Amanda Leck from AFAC, Shana McGuire from the Bureau of Meteorology, Anthony Clark from New South Wales Rural Fire Service, Fiona Dunstan from the Country Fire Service and from SafeCom. City. Uh, and we have Sasha Rundle from the ABC's Emergency Broadcasting Team and Hannah Tor from DFS in Western Australia. Um, I have worked with each of these wonderful people and they all have a uh, treasure trove of knowledge and information to share. In the format for today, what we'll do is each of them will um, come to the lectern here and, and talk a little bit about um, one area and one aspect of public information and warnings, and then we'll have a an opportunity to talk as a group and for you to ask some questions as well. So, without further ado, I might kick off um, by inviting Amanda Leck. Thanks. Thank you, Deb, and good afternoon. So, the evolution of public information and warnings. Where have we come from and where are we headed? In 2009, following the Black Saturday bushfires in Victoria, there was a national agreement for bushfire scale advice and warnings framework, so that's the three-level framework, advice, watch and act, and emergency warning that you would be familiar with. And after a period of time of implementing that across all the states and territories, it was determined that it was important that we actually review that practice to understand how it was working, uh, nationally to understand how communities perceive the warnings and so a national review of warnings and information was undertaken and I'd like to acknowledge Deb who actually uh, was um, the project lead on that with uh, Emergency Management Victoria. There were nine key recommendations and the first of those recommendations was to, as a priority, establish a dedicated multi-hazard national working group for public information and warnings. But at that time, there was really no home for that group. And so with the agreement of an endorsement of ANZEMC, the National Public Information and Warnings Working Group, which we affectionately know as the AFAC Warnings Group, was established in 2015 as part of the AFAC collaboration model to implement the recommendations from the National Review, to share good practice, and to continue to drive the evolution of warnings. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues and fellow panellists who are members of the, this national group, and particularly the chair of the group, Anthony Clark, from New South Wales Rural Fire Service. They've all worked incredibly hard over the past three years to really drive um, best, I'm going to say best practice, not good practice, in relation to public information and warnings. So as I said, the focus of the national review has been, or the focus of the national warnings group has actually been the implementation of those recommendations. It drives our agendas, it drives our work plan, we provide annual reports to the AFAC Council, the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee and the Bureau of Meteorology Hazard Services Forum. So we report against how we're tracking with regard to the implementation of those recommendations. AFAC's role within this um, is to facilitate that national collaboration because many of the recommendations actually needed to be implemented nationally. Some of them sit with the agencies and, and jurisdictions, but there was three key ones that actually sit nationally. So we facilitate national collaboration, it's effectively what AFAC does. It allows our members to, to share their practice, to share research and to improve the provision of public information and warnings. Recommendation two of the review centred on the need to improve our knowledge uh, in this particular part of the emergency management business. And the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience, or ADA, which is an operating division of AFAC and a partnership between AFAC, the BNA, Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC, and the Australian Red Cross, and it's actually funded by the Commonwealth through Emergency Management Australia, <coughs> maintains and develops a national handbook collection. Over the past 12 months, a significant body of work has been undertaken to develop the Public Information Warnings Handbook, which I'm very proud to hold up in my hand and it is on your screen. Um, and, and uh, some companion documents. The work has been undertaken by the AFAC Warnings Group members together with representatives of police and health who made up the Handbook Working Group and this handbook was actually launched yesterday by Stuart Ellis. 
at the uh, Australian Disaster Resilience Conference. The Public Information and Warnings Handbook provides nationally agreed principles of warnings policy and practice, explores research on effective warnings, and sets out the discipline of developing and issuing warnings. There are also two companion documents. Uh, we've rewritten Choosing Your Words with the assistance of researchers from Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC who embedded their research in that particular document and a code of practice for warnings for publishers. You can download the handbook from the ADA Knowledge Hub for free or you can actually buy a copy of it if you'd like to. A piece of work we did as part of the handbook work was actually to develop some principles for warnings. Warnings principles were first established in 2008. So as you can understand, there have been some time since they've been reviewed, some 10 years. So we reviewed those principles, the new principles you can see, and I believe we have a handout with you. Um, and those principles were endorsed by COSC at their meeting in early May for inclusion in the handbook. The principles guide the development and use of warnings in Australia. The other key thing that we've now agreed is a total warning system for Australia. The total warning system defines the essential elements of delivering warnings effectively with a life cycle of action before, during and after emergency. So, I mean, they're two pretty fundamental pieces of new doctrine we have and I would like to also acknowledge Deb as the author of the handbook and working with uh, everyone nationally to be able to deliver that. And finally, recommendation three of the review called the Greater National Consistency for Warnings Across Jurisdictions and Hazards. COSC has now committed to a consistent warnings framework across all states and hazards based on a three-level warning system. And we're currently undertaking some social science research across a range of hazards across Australia to understand how the community understands and receives warnings, what makes sense to them, so that we can use that research to uh, develop that warnings framework further. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for sitting and seeing everyone. Uh, so, at the Weather Bureau, we've been providing uh, information to the Australian uh, community for over 100 years. Uh, 100 years ago, you most likely would have received that information uh, through uh, the newspapers. Just catching up through the newspaper, uh, much like what's been shown up on the, on the top right there. Uh, perhaps 30, 30 odd years ago, we would have used the, the avenues of, of our emergency uh, partners in ABC to, to get that message out on radio, and we would have sent other telex uh, message across to them to, to read out, or, or indeed done the interviews ourselves, as you can see with the uh, Ward Rooney there pictured up in the, in the bottom right. Um, now, more recently, we've, we've uh, had television uh, information, and most of that information that we passed on uh, would have been in text format. And today, you'll see that the basis of our warnings hasn't really changed that much. Opportunistically, we've added maps. Uh, in some areas, we've added uh, Cap AU. The, the, the functionality still needs a little bit of work to, to fully be enabled. Uh, and we were also supplementing our uh, official warnings with lots of other products uh, on other channels such as tweets, uh, videos and the like. Um, so as you can see there's been an explosion in channels that we've had to adapt to and um, into the future we'll have to think about how we, how we do so to keep up with uh, the changing needs of our communities. So the Bureau's responsibility has responsibility to provide community warnings for gales, storms, other weather conditions likely to endanger life and property, <laughs> including weather conditions likely to give rise to flood or bushfires. Um, and that's outlined in the Meteorology Act of 1955. And it's also codified through an intergovernmental agreement uh, signed by the Commonwealth and the states and territories. And, um, to fulfil our obligations in uh, disseminating our warnings, we do so uh, very much in partnership uh, with all of your agencies, uh, including our emergency uh, broadcast partner, the ABC.
So at present we've uh, taken a, a, a stock take on where our warnings are at. Uh, so we've had a look at our 11 services. Uh, we've looked at uh, best practice from international, international uh, yeah, our world meteorological uh, partners in terms of multi-hazard early warning systems. Uh, a checklist has been developed. And also through the, the national doctrine, uh, which Amanda just outlined in terms of the, the principles and the total warning system. And so utilising that information, we've had a, a good hard look at uh, all of our 11 services and, and the related products uh, that, that, um, that sit underneath those. So there's about 57 products. And we've also had a, a look at the, the communication channels that we use uh, as they're expanding. So that analysis is, is currently in, in the middle of um, being completed, but um, we are very keen to make sure that once we uh, uh, have an idea of, of where our, our warnings sit against uh, <clears throat> what we think are good, uh, best, 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 uh, best evidence uh, practice, then we will we'll be able to see where the gaps are. And we're, we're very keen to make sure that our suite of warning services uh, are consistent and um, work very well together in a multi-hazard uh, situation. So uh, when we have heat, heat, we often have fire. So we need to really make sure that those services work well together. Well, when we have a tropical cyclone, uh, we, can have, we can have the wind, we can have the storm surge, we can have the, the heavy rainfall conducive to flash flooding. We can have riverine flooding. So we've got to make sure that uh, our different services make, uh, work well together in that, that sort of context. Uh, the, the information that uh, we've got from the World Meteorological Organisation and the trends that we've seen across the world have shown that um, <clears throat> being able to provide uh, information on what the weather will be is, is not enough. Not enough for the community. We really have to be able to communicate that and translate that into to what it will actually do and how that relates to what people value and what's at risk to them. Uh, so to do that, we really do need to, to move more towards impact-based forecasting and warnings. And that's something that we can't do alone. Uh, we'll have to do that in collaboration and help enable uh, our emergency service partners around the country uh, to better inform about consequences uh, through their warning services and in public information. But uh, we'll be working very closely with our Commonwealth partners in, in Geoscience Australia and, and Home Affairs. And, and some of you may have seen some of the talks over the last few days about some of the work that uh, is, is happening in that space. All right, now I will hand across to Anthony Clark. Thanks, um, thanks, Shani. Um, certainly a, an area of work that I'm really passionate about, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that we've actually come a long way over recent years. And one of the ways we've done that is trying to learn from experience. And uh, I think most agencies have engaged um, quite heavily in recent years in a research agenda, especially after major events, to learn more about how people actually receive information from emergency services and warnings providers, and importantly, if they actually do anything with the information that they receive. Not surprisingly, quite often, people aren't doing much. What we've found in some of our research this year, one of the fire incidents in New South Wales a couple of years back, the Sir Ivan fire up near Coonabarabran, uh, it's been spoken about a fair bit during the conference already. 55,000 hectares of land destroyed, a big impact on rural areas. We got feedback from the community after the, the fire that there was too much of a focus on saving houses and not farming country. Uh, some of the community felt let down by the emergency services. Another fire was the Kalula fire on the outskirts of Canberra. Uh, and again, this was a, a fire that took off quite quickly. Um, that first fire, Sir Ivan, was burning under catastrophic fire conditions. This fire uh, was not. And this actually gave us a really interesting insight into the way that people receive information from us and what they actually do as a result. Some of the key insights. People found that information and warnings were easy to understand, that they were up to date and useful. And this came from the community interviews that the University of Wollongong through the CRC conducted on our behalf. Unfortunately, Many people didn't actually do anything as a result of receiving these messages. This is one of the, the wicked problems that we're facing. There's good, recogni good recognition of the catastrophic fire danger warnings. 
In the lead up to that Sir Ivan fire, we had a huge swathe of New South Wales affected by catastrophic fire danger ratings. Uh, we sent out more than a million telephone warnings. That were received quite well by the community, but again, people didn't do much as a result. And, and what we actually found through the research, through the CRC, was that people started underestimating those lower levels, such as in the, the situation in Kalwula, where even when it was severe or extreme, people thought, well, at least it's not catastrophic, so I don't have to do anything. And the final one was when people receive warnings, they seek confirmation. For many of us, this is no great surprise, but the really surprising thing that came through from this research was this fact. This is kind of the Darwin concept. We tell people not to go out to the fire, so what do they do? They go and jump in the car and drive out to the fire to actually seek confirmation that there is a fire there. What we're now using this research for is potentially even to put information points in these locations where people actually go out to seek confirmation. Put a brigade there, put a truck there to actually get information when people are in that hot state and, and ready to actually receive information. And they're probably going to be more susceptible to, um, to doing uh, what we're asking them to do. The other one was more recently, and this one was in March of this year, and the Tarthra fire on the south coast of New South Wales down in the Bigger Valley area. Certainly an event that got a lot of coverage um, and, and a lot of media attention in the days and weeks afterwards. We, we look at this fire and, and think, look, this was a, a fairly extraordinary event happening at that time of year and impacting on the community in, the, in that way. Fortunately, not a single life was lost during that fire event, something that is quite often overlooked. But some of the insights, and, and these are just initial insights, there was an over-reliance both from agencies and the community on technology. During this fire, Power went down, mobile phone networks went down. There was already pretty dodgy mobile reception in Tarthra anyway. And there was feedback from the community that we didn't receive a warning, despite the agencies making their best effort in getting information out to the community. Technology fails when you need it most. There's potentially a need to recalibrate what success looks like. And again, we, we were criticised quite publicly about the handling of the fire, but also the, the delivery of information and warnings and the timeliness of it. I guess also we look at it and go, was it a success if no one lost their life? There were 65 homes destroyed in that fire, but potentially this is a, a, a success. And finally, longer fire seasons may require a community recalibration as well. This is a really interesting one because as the fire seasons uh, seem to get longer and longer and the periods in between get shorter and shorter, Potentially, we actually need to re-educate the community and deliver more information to them about what you can actually expect at any time of year. Because the feedback from the community was an event like this wasn't supposed to happen at that time of year, and the community simply wasn't ready to take action at that point. So there's some of the insights from some of the research that, that we've done over the last couple of years, and I think there's plenty of opportunities to further improve while we've come a long way uh, in the last decade or so. There's certainly a lot more room for improvement as well. And over to Fiona now. Thanks, Anthony, and thank you everyone for giving us the opportunity to discuss this really important topic today. So I'm going to briefly touch on our journey towards professionalisation. And what we've seen over really a relatively um, short period of time, as Amanda's highlighted, um, we, we've seen a, an adoption and embedding of public information awards function and capability within our organisations. Think back in the mid-1980s, it was when AIMS itself was actually developed. And then in 2004, it was when AFAC and the member agencies actually then agreed to adopt and embed AIMS version 3 within, within our agencies. For those of you who were working within the industry around that time, public information was really a subset of planning. And you would have an information officer, and that individual may be responsible for really predominantly a media release capability around warnings and also maybe running some community meetings. I'll say that sort of with a bit of a, an offhanded comment, but it really is through that process that we saw greater sophistication and demand and expectation from the community about what we needed to provide them as, as combatant or, or um, control agencies in this particular space. It wasn't really until around 2013 in response to the Black Saturday fires um, that we saw the real elevation of public information out of the, the planning cell into a public a function uh, and unit of its own. 
Um, it's through that process that we then started to identify the specific roles and capabilities that were required within a public information unit, such as acknowledging um, community liaison, media, and importantly, the warnings officer, as a skill set that was required to actually support that function going forward. It's also um, around that time that we acknowledged how important public information was. It's coming off the back of a number of inquiries, including the Victorian Royal Commission, and then really through each jurisdiction, we had our own inquiries that actually then started to question about how, how important was the, and how critical was the information we were delivering, and were we then appropriately resourcing and skilling our people in order to be able to undertake that capability. We'll use a, a South Australian example here. So within the CFS, it was around 2012 and 13 that we acknowledged that there is a, a unique skill um, that we need to elevate. And through that process, we placed our community engagement, our media, and our communications teams within state operations. And it was through that process and through the training and elevation of that position, it was very clear both to our agency, to our partners within the sector, and then more broadly, the public information warnings and community engagement are equally, if not more important, than actually putting out the fire. If we can't get the information and the safety messages out to the community, like it's making it very difficult for us to do the rest of what we're trying to achieve. So really the next part of that is the 2014 review of public information and warnings, again which Amanda's touched on today. And we started to see the evolution and doctrinisation of what it is we're doing. We was a lot of it in, in our heads. Um, we individually had agencies with um, pieces of information or doctrine around this, but we're really proud of the handbook that's been developed and launched at this particular conference um, that actually can then capture that into the warnings principles, our foundation principles, and also the total warning system. What that, that's done now is led to um, the work conducted by the EMPS. I'll just get that slide up. Um, and it's the Emergency Management and Professionalisation Scheme. So for many years we've seen the role of incident controllers being certified and the role and work that that's been undertaken in that space. But through the NPS scheme we've seen the role of public information officers acknowledged as um, a senior role, as an important function. And then what we've done is move towards the acknowledgement of a registration and then certification of that particular function. In that we've acknowledged that being uh, involvement in public information is more than just talking to the community. It is um, there's certain competencies required, there's skills, and we've also developed position descriptions and training required for each one of those functions that sit within that, that unit. Through the NPS, we've in, achieved the certification program, which acknowledges, uh, sorry, the registration and then certification, so that nationally we can have acknowledged function of public information and the skills required, and be able to then, um, at a glance, be able to see who we have available to be able to either deploy both um, nationally or internationally as required. And then also acknowledge the unique skill set that's required that we acknowledge in the incident controller about managing complex teams, strategic oversight, uh, and, and also the work that's required within the team about how we can bring that together to ensure that we continue to provide safe, clear, consistent, and timely information to the community. So on that point, I will promote the, the EMPS website. I encourage you to go and have a look. For those of you who are either um, trained in public information, I consider you, I encourage you to go and actually check this out and seek um, considering registration or certification. And also at the AFAC stand, there's a couple of people there, both Trina and Paul, who can speak to you about that process further. So thank you. First of all, I'd like to say I am from the ABC, but trust me, I'm not a journalist. I have been a journalist, I'm very proud of the work I did as a journalist covering fires, floods, a war zone, but I'm not a journalist. I'm the manager of emergency broadcasting and I'm really lucky to work with a great team of emergency broadcasters. So many people don't actually know what emergency broadcasting is. I guess I can tell you what it isn't. It isn't the, the news reports that you see on your TV or in the radio news or online. It's not news coverage of emergencies. They do fantastic work, both within the ABC and in other media organisations. However, if your house is on fire, 
you're unlikely to need to know whether that fire was started by an arsonist or a lightning strike. You don't really need to know the exact numbers of the fire tankers in your street. What you need to know is what you should be doing now to protect yourself, your family and your property. And that's what emergency broadcasting is. It's where we deliver frequent information, very, very frequent, which gives the audience the information they need so they can decide how they'll respond to that particular emergency event. And that is the information that is crucial at those times and before, during and after an, information, after an emergency. Now, that is done best when we collaborate, when we collaborate with your organisations, with the organisations represented up here, and with the many other emergency agencies around the country. I always think collaboration works best in emergencies when locals speak to locals. We have 52 different bureau and radio stations around the country, in regional stations, in metropolitan areas. And it is always best when we have locals in those areas speaking to the locals from your agencies to speak directly to that impacted audience. Our collaboration could also be managers, ringing managers of the agencies and asking for off the record planning information, information that will not be handed to a journalist, will not be given to anyone behind a microphone, but is intended to help plan ahead so that together we know, I guess, the scale and shape of that emergency. So we, like you, can ensure that there are adequate resources dealing with it. It could also involve managers sitting in emergency uh, state operations centres, which I know Hannah's going to be referring to. Or it could be our managers sitting on your district emergency management committees. Now, the reason we do this, the reason we collaborate, the reason why we are so involved in emergency broadcasting is in one sense because we're a bureaucratic organisation and like all good um, bureaucratic organisations, we have a policy. It is our emergency broadcasting policy. And it says quite clearly that we will work with you, we will work with our stakeholders to give the audience that information that they need in an emergency event. But in reality, the reason we are involved in emergency broadcasting is because it is in the best interests of the community. The community absolutely expects the ABC to be there and to provide that emergency broadcasting information. It's been quite interesting during the past couple of days, particularly with the keynote speakers. I've, I've heard a theme of vulnerability coming to the fore. Mark Crosweller mentioned it in his talk yesterday. We heard it again this morning with uh, Dana mentioning vulnerability. And in March, with the Tartar bushfires that you've heard Anthony refer to, the ABC had to come face to face with its own vulnerability. We didn't handle those fires in the way that we should have, in the way we thought we were handling them. And as a result, we have had to go back and take a good hard look in the mirror and assess our own vulnerability for emergency broadcasting. To look at what are the needs as we have a changing staff structure as we have new people coming in, a younger staff presence who may not have experienced emergencies or may not have experienced fires before. And from that, we have learnt that in order to collaborate fully with the agencies and best serve the audience, we need to provide that absolute support and look at our vulnerability and our stations that need that support more than others and throw everything at them in, uh, in times of emergency. Now, with the community, they know to come to us, and they do come to us. They come to us in all different channels because, as we heard, in an emergency, people need to be informed not once that this is happening, not twice, but even three or more times. They need that reinforced before they're likely to take action. So that means that we need to engage the community in all the ways that they are currently engaging. Yes, we will broadcast warnings on radio, on local radio. Yes, you will see on ABC News 24 the, the ticker running across the bottom of the screen that tells people about that emergency event. But yes, on social media as well, because as we all know, that's where the Australian public is. That's where the international public is. And if we are going to truly inform and warn the public, we need to be playing in the spaces that they are playing in. And we need to do it according to their rules. 
We all know what it's like to sit somewhere and just be scrolling through our phones. Well, in order to truly engage that audience, we need to have the thumb-stopping posts, the great images, the great photos and great graphics that will make them stand up and take notice. We are even using emojis to help share the information about the warnings that, that your agencies uh, distribute. And even from within our own teams, I'm often asked, why would we use emojis? This is an incredibly serious event. But it's because in order to best engage that public and truly get them to take action and to not drive down the road to look at the fire, we need to be liaising with them and engaging with them using the language that they speak. So these are some of the ways that the ABC is already working. We've had great collaboration through AFAC and through the, uh, the Public Warnings Working Group and through the various agencies and we look forward to doing that into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. So I'm Hannah Chagall, Department of Fire and Emergency Services and um, when I was asked to put this together um, I came up with the title um, Driving to Catch Up with the Ferrari, Running to Catch Up with the Ferrari because that's sometimes what public information feels like to us in the industry. Can I just ask people to put their hand up if they remember a time before alerts and warnings? Yep, yeah. exactly. So look, alerts and warnings are only about mm, 10 to 15 years old, was it Amanda? 10 to 15 years old. And I only came to DFES um, probably about four years ago. Now those of you that aren't from Western Australia um, probably know we think of ourselves a bit like Stephen Bradbury, you know the ice skater that um, won the gold medal in the Winter Olympics before, no? We just wait till everyone else has done it and falls over and then we come in and we win the gold behind. <laughs> so, so look, four or five years ago in Western Australia, um, we were facing a real challenge that um, we were pretty behind the eight ball in terms of alerts and warnings and what we were going to do. Um, and people say I look like a little generous. So this was me when I walked in and realised that this was my big challenge. Um, and you can see me go through, yes, me and Ellen did share a very bad childhood where I was, um, did have hair like that and was a bit fat. Um, and then it was the shock and disbelief that we were probably really underprepared for a major emergency right the way through to coming to terms with it, getting on the phone, calling a few of these guys and working out what we were going to do and taking that challenge. And so the last three years has really been a, a massive journey for us as to what we did. Just to take you through that a little bit, um, for those of you that might be facing similar challenges in your own organisations, there's a job to do first of all to stop and take an audit and really think, right, what do we need to do now? Where's the gaps? Um, and trust me, when you're working in public information, there's so much new stuff out there. Technology is running at such a pace. The public uh, actions and the attitudes are changing at such a pace that um, you, you get a bit behind. Even if you think that you're ready, every time we turn around and meet as a group, there's more to do, isn't there? So, Look, there's an audit to do, um, and we really became research-based in our warnings. That meant going out to the community and asking them what they want. Shocking, I know, but we did it. Um, and then really changing the way that we talk to the community and the way that we structure our warnings. And if you're interested, there's a huge body of work and a huge body of information out there now around how people like to receive information. But it's an age today where temperature-triggered advertising is something that we can even consider. I mean, can you imagine that? It reaches 30 degrees and I don't even have to push a button. Um, it just automatically means that um, we know there might be bad fire conditions out there and I can change the adverts that are reaching you in your own home, on your cell phone, wherever you are. And that's an amazing thing. So in a world where all this technology is happening, how do we get ready for that? And how do we take advantage of that? The other thing that we did was talk to Sasha about, well, uh, we need to work in partnership with the ABC. And when we're all in the SOC, uh, which is our state operations centre, sorry, it's really difficult to try and take calls from 20 different ABC stations. Those of you that um, have done a job like mine will, will understand this. And so the ABC is now embedded in our state operations centre with us. They sit alongside us, not a journalist, but somebody like Sasha, who's here, who's from WA, who sits alongside my team, who takes all of those different calls from the ABC, corrals them in together, and then gives us a, a quite a neat list of, look, if you're going to prioritise three, here's the three that we want you to prioritise. And then here's the rest of nice-to-haves that we'd like. 
So that partnership and, and convincing people within DFES that actually don't sound that scary and that we should work with the ABC at this level has been an amazing journey and it's, it's created some really big results for us. Um, we also have the world's, not the world's, Australia's first virtual operations support team. And that's a group of people who um, sit at home um, when they're not in work. They work for Bankwest, most of them, and, um, and can help us out with our alerts and warnings and our posts when we reach capacity. And that comes down to what Craig Fugate talked about um, earlier yesterday morning when he said, you know, we don't, uh, we only practice to succeed. We don't actually practice beyond the scope of our imagination. So having that surge capacity is becoming more and more important. And our virtual operations support group is one of the things that we've worked on. We brought uh, international and national conferences to um, our local governments uh, in the form of the Emergency Media and Public Affairs Conference, bringing the best speakers in so that they don't just listen to someone like DFES who is, let's face it, facing challenges of um, being too authoritarian because we're a fire agency, that's what we do, and hearing from the experts themselves so that people can get that range of information to know how they can improve and what, what they want to do. And we're turning towards now um, more process mapping so that you know if we all get hit by a bus, everything will be written down in a nice clear way. And also um, how we take advantage of vision. The vision that's out there now is incredible, isn't it? Um, cameras on trucks. When we had the Waruna fires, I don't know if, you, if you're aware, but there is this amazing vision um, from Parks and Wildlife guys who've just had a dash cam and they've turned it on and it just got played for weeks and weeks as the scale of the Waruna fire. Um, now those guys, when they went to get out of their trucks to the Roaring Fire, couldn't actually open the doors of their trucks because the wind was howling too much that they couldn't even push their doors open to get out and even take stock of what's around them. We wouldn't have been able to experience or sense um, the noise, the light, the sound, the darkness that was there um, when day turned to night if it wasn't for that vision as well. So bringing um, more live feeds and bringing more cameras to our operational crews is something that we're also trying to do so that we can really improve the way that we deliver the community our public information. So look, um, there's a lot of challenges for the future. I won't go through all of them, but capacity is one, NBN is another. And um, the last thing that I will leave you with is this concept that um, we still send one PIO to a fire ground and we still send one MLO to a fire ground and we think, great, they're there, they can do a good job. In the meantime, we now have about 50 media descending on one place. And we probably have about 40 other stakeholders that we're now being told to work with. And two people are not going to cut it. Um, I challenge everybody here to think about a new way of public information where we actually resource up. Now, where that resource comes from is going to be really, really challenging. I don't know where it comes from yet. I'm still working on it. I've got my eye on SES volunteers, if anyone's around. Um, but look, we're going to need to resource up, and I imagine a place where there's 20 people in a public information team at a fire ground. Because things have moved on since 15 years ago when we decided two people. Um, and if we don't change, and if we don't run to catch up with the Ferrari, um, then we just won't be in the game. And we, you know, the definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We can't do that any longer, it's time to change. This is a Ferrari. It is here to stay and uh, there's a lot of challenges but um, I'm sure that you'll all be with me in thinking that together we can come up with the answers. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks. Thanks everyone and um, I think you should all um, just acknowledge that six communication-ish type people who like to talk stayed on time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we still have the chance to have a conversation now, which is wonderful, and thank you to all of you. Um, I wonder if we should talk a little bit more about getting the message through. So we've heard um, about some of the, the ways that we're doing that and the research that's informing what we're thinking about. I guess um, I'm thinking a bit more about the, what really is going to get the behaviour that we're looking for, the decision making behaviour that we need from people. A few years ago we were still talking about channels, and how many ways can we reach them, um, and I think we've moved on. I wonder, Anthony, do you want to extend a little bit more? 
Deb, can I just ask Anthony as well, can you talk to us about um, the way that you do your pre-warning as well on catastrophic fire days? Because I think that's um, a great strategy and I think it'd be worth sharing. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, it is, yeah. Um, well, I, I think, firstly, it, it's really important to acknowledge, as, um, as it's now articulated in, in the handbook, that there's a long process in the lead-up to warnings. Uh, and that includes educating and engaging the community. And I think in recent years, the industry has looked at new approaches. And I'm thinking things like behavioural insights, you know, that companies have been using this for years now um, to sell more stuff. You know, and it's, it's a multi-million dollar business and, and it delivers huge profits for them. And finally, I think the industry is looking at that there's some guidance on how we can actually change people's behaviour and I suppose complete the sale with the community so that they actually take the action that we're looking for. And that investment does actually come well before there's smoke in the air or before there's storm clouds out on the horizon. And I think it's really important to, to invest in that engagement well before the event. I think in, in terms of getting the, the language right, in terms of getting the outcome that we're looking for. I'm thinking about some of the, the research that's recently been done through the, the CRC, for instance, and pretty pretty amazing stuff, which five years ago we would never have even thought about, where, where you're putting a warning message in front of somebody and you're actually looking at where their eyes go on the screen to see what they're taking in and what words they're picking up on and does a picture here actually make them take action more than if it's just a slab of text. Like, it's, it's some new approaches like that that I think are really helping us deliver um, much more on message messages, things that are, that are really going to get the outcome. To Hannah's point, you know, pumping out a million telephone warnings before a day of catastrophic fire danger. Can I tell you, we saw that coming three or four days out, and you know, we, we think we're pretty good at crafting messages, but God, we sat there for three days contemplating what words to put in there, what word will be the one that actually gets people to take action. And then of course, because we're so focused on that, we actually forgot to mention it was catastrophic tomorrow. We left the day out of the actual text message. Um, but it, it, it does show like using all of these different inputs, and this is something that kind of keeps us awake at night. Choosing the words, choosing the imagery, you know, I, I think also we're, we're now in the game of engaging content. We're content producers, we're content providers, and if that gets the outcome that we're looking for, fantastic. Absolutely. And we should mention that one of the companion documents with the handbook is Choosing Your Words. So if anyone's familiar with the original Choosing Your Words, it's been revised um, and released this week as well. Um, what about the issue of trust versus authority? Who do you like to talk to? Quite a few. Um, once upon a time, and in other cultures internationally, uh, authority would be, you know, all you needed to say it's time to go. Uh, our culture isn't doing that. What do we yeah, think? Oh, can I just add to that? I think Anthony did touch on that when he um, presented, mm -hmm. and, and we see that with some of the research that's come out of the CRC and more, more broadly around that people are seeking that authority source, but it's not the only source. So uh, it's about using that authority source to confirm and ensure that. Um, you're, you're a voice, but you're acknowledging that you're not going to be the only voice in that space. So through the research, uh, we've found that people want to seek out, so they'll go to an ABC or they'll go to an emergency service or police or whoever that is, um, and there are different arrangements within each, within each state and jurisdiction. Uh, but then they'll actually then go and qualify that. So whether or not it's through a trusted friend, family member, or through a network that they have. So it really, really emphasises that strength of community and about the, the knowledge that, and value that we need to place in the local information that the community has and ensure that we're, we're using that local knowledge to inform our messaging as well. Amanda? I just wanted to make the point um, with regard to that that this is a really um, fast moving space in terms of warning republishers, and that's actually one of the companion documents. And, the original one, I think, was written in about 2008 by um, probably some bureaucrats, probably somewhere in Canberra, and it was written as a sort of very formal code of practice. And we, we took one look at it and said, that's not the space we're in now. So 
It's been completely rewritten to understand who will be republishing the information issued by the Fire and Emergency Services and others, such that a Facebook group can pick it up and follow some you know, key guidelines that the industry's provided, or an ABC is an official emergency broadcaster. So we've tried to make something that we think will be useful for people because people are consuming their information and their warnings in a whole range of ways from a whole range of channels. I think DB used the example of your insurance company issuing purple warnings, but they're purple, but they're purple. <laughs> That's a really good point and it's uh, an example of the evolution or the pace of evolution of the practice in that not so long ago we would be trying to say to people, you don't publish warnings, we publish warnings and now the message is completely flipped about. Um, Sasha, what do you see in the social media space? I must say when you said emoji I went to all the wrong places. Yeah. Um, but what do you see in terms of sharing warnings and, and um, others picking up your warnings and using well, I think that's where collaboration is really, really strong because it's not enough for an ABC to simply uh, post a warning and expect all oh, the public is now aware. In the same way, it's not enough for an agency, a single agency, to merely post a warning. We all have to be sharing each other's um, content because everyone is a content um, maker these days. We all have to be sharing that and we have to encourage the community to, to also share information. So whether that is um, via social media, whether that is um, a radio announcer telling the audience, if you know someone who lives in that area and you don't think they are listening to this radio station, can you please tell them about this information? Can you contact them and make them aware? Because we all have to be responsible for the broader community and try to try to help that broader community know what is coming their way in the same way that that community needs to also take responsibility themselves for preparing themselves and preparing their friends and loved ones. Um, Shani, not so long ago we put out a lot of warnings about the hazard and you touched on the fact that we're now trying to talk about the consequences of the hazard and that impact both warning. How much of a shift is that? for all of us, but for the Bureau as well? Oh, look, it's a tremendous shift because it really does show that we, we need to form relationships ahead of uh, any event and make sure that we're, we're connecting with the right people who have that other pieces, all those other pieces of the puzzle. We, we have a, a lot of information and experience in and around and our weather mm. and, and the hazard, but uh, the information about you know, what the hazard will actually do is not, not the realm of the Bureau, so we, we really need to connect up with the right people and, and make sure that we're seeing what we do all the way through to, to our community to see what is making that difference to, to the community. And I, I don't know if we've used the term, but that call to action. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the need to actually give someone something that they can do um, and make that very clear. Yeah, and I think, you know, the climate change space is an interesting space in that we, we used to go out and talk about climate change from the Bureau the agricultural community and if we went out by ourselves we didn't leave them with a solution but if we went out with uh, some other experts some agronomists or uh, some, some other experts that they're used to doing business with they'd go oh look we've got all the technology that you're using at minimum till um, and then the increase in yield that you're getting from the different seed types and these sorts of things the amount of variability that you had to live with then it put them in a better space to be able to cope and see if they were coping and that they did have a solution and I think it's a similar sort of we, we come in and tell the story about what's going to happen with the weather, um, but then our partners and, and the community themselves uh, come up with, you know, what, what, do we what do? should we do? Yeah. I'm wondering, I'm hoping, that you haven't run out of questions after a very big conference. Are there any questions that you would like to ask the panel? Do you have a question down the front here? Um, uh, my name is Intili, and I'm actually from the, uh, the other conference, and Amanda Leckie uh, suggested I attend. So I, I, uh, you might consider me to be a republisher. Uh, one of the frustrations that I have, which is uh, the, the impetus for what, for what I do, is the siloed nature of uh, the various different agencies that do, do their work. And they all do a fantastic job, and 
I'm not criticising that at all. And uh, but it strikes me that working on a, a consistent uh, notification warning system between all the organisations could potentially be addressed by having one location where everybody goes to find out what's going on. So just like we all go to Bomb to find out what's going on with the weather. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So it kind of sounds like I might have struck the nerve too. So I'd be interested to know what the panel thinks. Okay. Well, we think a foundational piece to that is actually that recommendation three I spoke to, which is a national warnings framework. It's very difficult to have any sort of, you know, national platform or even to be able to communicate with the community about what different warning levels mean and are and you know who they apply to when at the moment it's pretty much a dog's breakfast across the country for a whole range of hazards. Bushfire, um, tsunami are the only hazards that really have a nationally consistent warnings framework. So you can travel from Tasmania to far north Queensland and know that when you receive a watching act it means the same thing and you, you know, should take the same action. I think the ABC would also like that system in place as well, so I think that others talk to this matter. So I absolutely acknowledge that, that challenge and we often find that even within jurisdictions that there's the same challenge there. So uh, Amanda touched on it a, a little earlier but we are in the process of undertaking some social research. So part of the review of the new national fire danger rating system, uh, there is money put aside for social research to go out to community uh, to undertake their understanding of the current national fire danger rating system the warning system for bushfire that's um, that's coupled with that. And we've been very fortunate through, um, really through representation nationally through every agency and jurisdiction to receive additional funding to test for other hazards, warnings for other hazards as well. So in the next, or actually next week, our survey goes live um, and we'll be testing nationally 5,500 people to gain their current understanding of financial ratings, whether or not they are meaningful whether the language, colours and symbology is meaningful and what people are acting on it, together with the warnings frameworks that um, are five main hazards that the, the country is exposed to. And from there we'll be then conducting 49 focus groups to go through with symbology, colours and language to again unpack further with community directly around um, their understanding of warnings and those symbols and colours. And then we'll be quantifying that with another round of 5,500 um, surveys so that we'll be able to come back with very strong recommendations to be able to say this is what is meaningful for the community so that we can then build towards that three-tiered national warning system for all hazards. So that's really that foundation piece and evidence and it's actually about <coughs> excuse me, engaging the community and asking what the community wants to actually then inform that national warning system. And, and I think there's a real drive from the industry to get this right and actually work with the community to work out what will work with the community because I think if, if, if you look at and I'm not singling out um, any particular hazard or agencies or anything like that, but this mindset that if you live on the New South Wales Victorian border that the river only spills over one way towards Victoria or New South Wales <laughs> and it's called something different, it doesn't make sense if you live on that border. You know. The, the flood doesn't suddenly become a different flood because you're on the New South Wales side or the Victorian side. It's the same with bushfires, it's the same with, with cyclones. And cyclones are quite often held up by people as a great way of um, explaining different warning levels and, and times to impact, but it's actually not nationally consistent either. So there's huge opportunity there and the industry is really keen to get this right. And I think uh, earlier we mentioned trust and I think if we can hold the trust of the community, we do need to get this, this right and make it as easy as possible. I think in our other parts of our lives you see that with your mobile phone, we're already getting the integration of all the different bits of information happening, so we've got to be, we've got to be smarter and make sure that we're doing that for the community as I think Sasha said, that we've got to be doing, doing our communicating in the way the community, community's already doing it. I can see that there is actually passion in your question, it's and I'm sure to, everyone would love to talk more. Yeah, it's, it's, it's close to my heart. I used to live in Cairns in far north Queensland, so I dropped the cycle on Debbie was, was a, a major event, which hopefully might talk to you guys. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to hold the microphone, but uh, you are. just a comment, sorry. <laughs> just a comment in terms of retail.
high demands for for what the ability gives the community. Uh, I work on a project which gets 50,000 uh, unique users a day, um, but actually do only tracks one one third of that, and that's because of ad blockers. So they're actually becoming more of an influence now. So that would be something I'd suggest to you. Thank you. We could talk um, for an entire session, couldn't we, on social media and social digital channels and algorithms and all those sorts of things as well. So um, definitely on the on the agenda, the broader agenda. We've got time for one more question. Does anyone have a question? Oh, there's a question up here. Yeah, yeah well, Chris from a community uh, just east of Earth, but a lot of we find a lot of people don't use social media. Has there been any research into other avenues like PA systems and stuff like that around the communities? Mm -hmm. So different. Yeah. This talks to Craig. If I can take that one, yeah, that'd be good. Um, there was after uh, we were in a yellow. There was. Um, if you're aware, the Ferguson Inquiry uh, recommended that we do some investigation into PA systems and what they look like. Um, it wasn't done by Fire and Emergency Services, it was done by, at the time, the Office of Emergency Management. And I think the conclusion of that piece of research found that across the 139 different local governments, there was um, probably about 50 different ways of using local sirens and PA systems, and to bring that together would have created um, <coughs> possibly more confusion than um, benefit to the community. So the outcome of that piece of research was, if it works for your community, keep doing it. Um, it has to be what's right for you at a local level. Um, but it wasn't the right answer to try and standardise it across Western Australia because we found places where that would have um, really not worked and really um, caused more harm than good. Um, but absolutely, it needs to be so many different forms and channels of communication. And this is where local people know best. At the end of the day, um, there's only so much that we can say from a state perspective. Whereas local people will have many different channels. I know for Preston Beach, um, we were trying to get a message out to Preston Beach during the Warina Yalu fires and people came up to me and they said, well, don't you know, you just need to go to the local store and the guy at the general store then puts a post here and then that person takes it down the street and then everyone gets told. So each community has a way of working. We need to respect that. We need to make sure that we're not coming in as the experts into any community and, and thinking we know best and listening to you and finding those influences and connectors and making sure that they come first. Thank you. And um, ladies and gentlemen, that is all we have time for this afternoon. Uh, we are about to head into the closing session of the conference. Um, just a reminder that the um, brand new public information and warnings handbook from which some of this conversation has um, come from is now available online for free on the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience Knowledge Hub. Companion documents are also there. Can you please join me in thanking Hannah, Sasha, Fiona, and <laughs> Jenny.